Go ahead. Was he, Go ahead, he was on the 95. All right, joining us right yeah. now is former Cleveland Indians pitcher, current Cleveland Guardians analyst, Jensen Lewis. Jensen, what's up, man? Welcome to the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show again. Great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Jensen, I don't know if you heard our poll results there, but 58% of the fans don't like the trade. Now, we understand that it probably has nothing to do with the prospect because probably 98% of the people that voted in that poll have never heard of that kid before. However, I, I, you know, we get it. I mean, it's, it's a soft... It, listen, the Guardians could still win this division. It stinks. They could still possibly win it. But it is a sign that that trade wasn't about trying to win this year. So do you understand the fan frustration? Do you get it? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think you unpack this on a couple of things. Uh, the short term is I don't know if we'll have uh, a higher value for Aaron Savali considering the last couple of years, guys, that the injury history has really been prevalent. And I think the, the organization has been really good all the way back to when they traded Corey Kluber and, and even the host of starting pitchers, you you go with Carrasco and Clevenger and Bauer. Uh, and knowing when to trade these guys, it seems they've nailed them at their apex. And after they deal them, it, it's really falling on hard times. We'll, we'll have to see here in a couple of years if that remains true for Aaron Savali. But even relievers too, Andrew Miller, Cody Allen, a couple of the stalwarts here in Tito's uh, tenure, and, and they really uh, fell on hard times as well. So true. I think you're looking at a short term, number one, Tampa Bay. Anytime you trade with Tampa Bay, you always have that moment of pause, and we yep. obviously know that with the Andy Diaz and the Jake Bowers trade. So completely understand the fans, a little apprehension, if you will, with that. The other side of this, though, is you look at Kyle Manzardo, and I I tried to get on uh, the horn with as many uh, people across the league yesterday and and just to become a a little bit more educated on on this kid. And and to a man, everyone loves where this guy's bat-to-ball is, and he fits right in with where – Cleveland wants to be it feels like the last year or two the power has started to develop and remember he's 23 guys and I I don't think we can pass judgment that even though he's had the injury this year that this is going to be someone that we're going to have to wait I I think they want him in their plans as soon as he's healthy and he can really show what he can do so on the surface guys the trade you had to trade Savali at his highest value what does that mean moving forward for this year I think the season could have been doomed when we got the diagnosis of Shane Bieber going to the 60-day and not being back until September 10th. I'm sorry, it, it is almost impossible to overcome not having Bieber, McKenzie, Cal Quantrill. If you guys remember, I know, Jason, you, you've been there in plenty, and you can see it as well. 30-plus starts from these guys last year. They were the big reason why this team was able to find their way into the postseason. It could still hold true this year. But now you find yourself in a much more degree of difficulty because it's three young guys in Gavin Williams, Tanner Bybee, Logan Allen. You have some inning restrictions you're probably going to be up against here as you get to the end of August. Let's see what happens with Noah Syndergaard, even after a really nice start from him yesterday. And then how do you fill the number five spot? So it's not over. And I think, Bull, you kind of hit on it. The Central Division stinks. I mean, it really does. And Minnesota hasn't done anything yet to really launch themselves as a true favorite. Jensen, I agree with everything you said. I don't hate the trade. But if you're one of the 26 guys in that clubhouse, you can't be happy with this because you are trying to make the postseason. What do you say if you're Chris Antonetti or if you're Tito? How does Tito get these guys to hold on and to buy in when they lost one of their beloved guys in Ahmed Rosario and now you just lost your best starting pitcher of the guys that are available right now for not a lot of help for this year. So how do you sell this to the guys in the clubhouse? Yeah, Jason, I'll go back to kind of my own personal experience in back-to-back years in 2008 and 2009 when we traded CC Sabathia yeah. and Cliff Lee and both those guys coming off their Cy Young campaigns. You want to talk about waving a white flag right in front of our face. That's what that felt like yep. in successive seasons there. So that was really a tough blow for us to deal with. And then our heart and soul, Victor Martinez, going to Boston. That that really hurt big time because he was such a leader both on and off the field. Uh, if I put myself in this locker room in the present day, I, I don't feel that the shock value is as high trading those two aces from, from back when I played. <clears throat> but I get to, to where you're going as far as morale. Ahmed knowing that he was such a leader and then also Aaron pitching as well as he has. There's two ways to go with this, and I think this is why Tito kind of mentioned, hey, let's get through Tuesday. Let's see if there's anything else that's going to be made as far as the deadline being at 6 p.m. 
Then we'll address it with the group probably on Wednesday before the day game and they come home. Are there more moves to be made? If they are, it feels like they're ancillary. It feels like they're around the edges. And I think they've just kind of pushed their chips to the middle and say, we feel confident in the future of our starting rotation, both here at the big league level and whoever they're going to eventually bring up, whether it's this year or at the beginning of next year. You know, Jensen, um, you know, I, you know, I usually speak from a, a casual, uh, you know, a casual place. And, and, and a lot of fans are sometimes confused that, you know, it just seems like for the Guardians, their best players are always on the block. It's, it's like there's this there's an imaginary ticking clock that goes like and it's, it's just it's just watching the Guardians and just watching how they operate. Um, it, it's almost like, OK, we see Savali and we, even with Shane Bieber, he's it's a blow to the team that uh, Shane Bieber was uh, going to miss and not come to September, come out to September off the DL. But it's, but we were already shopping him. We were trying to get his trade value higher enough so we can move him. It just seems like some people when I talk to, you know, the casual fans, they're like, you know, it just seems like, you know, we got Gavin Williams, we got Bybee. But we know in the back of our mind, we're not going to be able to keep those guys. So how does the organization kind of toe that line? And, and, do, and do they understand kind of the, the little apprehensiveness that the fans have? Because they're always on this like ticking top clock that people have to be moved. Yeah, I think you go look at Beaver as a case study first and foremost. And, and a lot of people need to realize that some of these extension talks and, and some of these you know, long-term deal discussions are really held behind closed doors. And there's a reason why they don't become public so that there can be integrity for those negotiations back and forth. And, you know, this club has made overtures to Shane Bieber and there has been an impasse for that. And, you know, part of that is on the player as well. Uh, When you're offered life-changing money and you turn it down, that's your decision and you're allowed to have that. But also that will end up coming to the forefront here if indeed a trade is made. And that remains to be seen, too, because I think they're trying to get him back. And let's let's kind of look forward, too, guys. Let's assume that Shane Beaver does come back on September 10th and this team is still a game or two out of first place. You all of a sudden have basically a deadline deal that's going to come in the last couple weeks of the season. What does his effectiveness look like? That remains to be seen as well. You hope that Cal Quantrill can get back here. And I know they're going to be very, very delicate with Tristan McKenzie because they feel he can be a top rotation arm for years to come. But I get where you're where you're at, too. I, I think this is why the importance of Jose Ramirez signing as team-friendly a long-term deal that he did was to not only create a domino effect with Andre Jimenez, Trevor Steffen, Emmanuel Classe, uh, Miles Straw in there as well. Again, I, I know the star power is where fans are looking for. And if Gavin Williams and Tanner Bybee and, and a heck, even Logan Allen, we, we look at years past when it was John Hart and Dan O'Dowd, and they locked in their young players to very team-friendly contracts, but it was also life-changing money for those guys that had a very short amount of service time. It would not surprise me if this front office goes down a similar path here, knowing that you can lock in a young core at a very early age, both in that rotation and then all, also with some of these young position players like Quan, like a Will Brennan, and, you know, who, who knows what happens here in September with some of the call-ups they might have as well. And the Braves have certainly done that with a high degree of success yeah. in recent years. And that's a big part of the reason why they're probably the best team in baseball right now. Uh, you mentioned all those contracts. I'm happy with all those contracts, except for one. we got to talk about Miles <laughs> Straw. I, you know, I'm always yelling and screaming about it. Uh, this is not 19, you know, 78 where you could play with a center fielder that can't hit. I don't understand why he plays every day, Jen. I, 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 you, you get no power. They've got, what, 11 home runs from their outfielders total? I understand maybe there's not great options at the moment. But even if it's not this year, I think next year, Miles Straw, to me, can't be an everyday player. They pinch, hit, pinch runner, great defensive replacement, fine. I hope next year they move Quan to center and they get some legitimate corner outfielders. Do, do you think they should do that? Do you think they will do that? I, I honestly, Bull, I'd love to see Will Brennan uh, play center field okay. and leave Kwani in left. It, it just feels like Kwani is so comfortable over there now. And, and really, uh, I mean, heck, it feels like we have on, on Guardians Live a, a relay throw from him or Miles Straw that's a play of the week. And I think Will, uh, knowing that he's got that center field instinct as well, makes a lot of sense there. They sent Oscar Gonzalez down to AAA to do damage. He did do damage. And it's perplexing 
why he's not getting some opportunities to make that translate at the big league level here. Perhaps we see that yep. uh, in the coming weeks. I hope we do. Um, last night, and I, I understand watching that game, you, know, you had David Fry, who's hit over 300, uh, I think, with runners in scoring position, uh, a guy that has really found uh, the ability to be clutch in those situations. Uh, you have an opportunity with one swing of the bat to get within one run. Uh, y- 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 you think that in Houston, knowing you're going to have to score four or five to win anyway, uh, that that would have been a, a move to go with. So. Yep. I understand the frustration there, and you know th- this is a, a team that that needs every viable bat, every offensive weapon they can, and hopefully they're implemented here in the next couple of weeks. Gents, you mentioned Tristan earlier. Uh, I was on the call with Chris Antonetti yesterday, and Chris kind of surprised me a little bit. He made it sound like Tristan's coming back in September, and I guess I mean you're a pitcher, you would know the timeline better than anyone. Is the thought here? Hey, let's give this a shot in September. And if it doesn't work, he could, he's already uh, next year's shot anyway if he has the surgery. If they had the surgery right away, all of next year would be shot. So is the thinking here, let's give it a shot in September, and then if he has to have surgery, he's still back for the start of 25 anyway? Yeah, Jason, and, and the conversation usually goes because the player has the ultimate call. If they, if they want to have that surgery right away, then, then that's up to them. They can be presented with all the information, you know, from the team. If they want a second opinion, they can do that. Uh, but it seems as though uh, your information lines up as well with Tristan wants to give it a go, wants to try and get back. If it's a handful of starts to push him across the finish line to get into the postseason, try and go for that. Because as you said, likely if he had this, the surgery right away, most of next year is gone already. So why not try and at least make one final push? I understand that from a player perspective. Whether that makes sense for the club in the long term as far as 2024 and beyond also remains to be seen. So the thinking perhaps from where Chris Antonetti and and those guys understand those conversations with both Bieber and McKenzie better than any of us do is we trade Savali now because we feel like we can get, if not two, maybe all three of Bieber, McKenzie, and Quantrill back at some point after the deadline. Those are our quote-unquote deadline acquisitions, and we feel – that for the long-term future, it was too good of a situation to pass up knowing Savali's injury history, and you had to strike when his value was highest. So I think we'll learn a lot more here in the next 7 to 10 days because now you're getting towards the end or at least the the ultimate point of the AAA season in which you're going to have to find games where these guys can get into game action and then be ready to roll because if they stay in contention, Cleveland does – September is going to be filled with a lot of critical contests. Yeah, Jensen, uh, I want to talk about the bullpen a little bit. You know, Emmanuel Classe has got a ton of saves, but he hasn't been as sh- – he's not been bad, but he's not been nearly as sharp as he was last year. Watching him, what are you seeing, and what is the difference for last year where he was, you know, along with Edwin Diaz, one of the two best closers in baseball, to being still good but not as dominant? What, what, what are you seeing there? Yeah, well, almost impossible to ask him to, to replicate what he sure. did last year. And, and even this year, as you said, uh, having the amount of blown saves that he has, if you, if you kind of isolate those outings and you look and see what really transpired, leadoff walks or, or you know, a lack of command in those first couple of hitters. And, uh, again, as a former reliever, those are things that will happen throughout the portion of a season. What I look for is the velocity – and the movement, particularly the late movement of the slider, it feels like he's getting back to where he was in the stretch run of last year. Uh, I think if you see him a little bit more on the corners now, uh, especially with a cut fastball, even back door to lefties, it, there's, there's a couple of weapons that he deployed August and September last year. Even the high fastball, high cutter to change eye level to get back to the slider, it feels like he's on that path. It's just the guys in front of him, and Trevor Steffen has been better, but I, for the life of me, I feel like in a situation last night, boy, we could have used James Karinczak uh, in that sixth inning to be able to come in for some possible swing and miss. I realize there's been some struggles there with Eli, with Sam Hentges. It hasn't been the same shutdown group last year, but it, it feels like you still got one of your best bullets in AAA, and why not bring him in? knowing you've got some really good offenses you're going to face, particularly in Houston and yeah. also with Toronto at the end of that homestand next week. You talk about, you think about the mental game, and obviously you would know this better than anybody, 
the mental game and the pressure of being a relief pitcher because for the most part when you do well nobody talks about it and when you do poorly we do you think about like Karen check right he's got all the tools but he it seems like from an outsider's perspective he gets in his head too much and that screws him up look at I mean Kelly last night he gets the great at bat where he strikes out Tucker and then he can't throw the ball over the plate I mean like what, like, I would assume he's going to go down to Columbus today. I don't know. Like, what's going through his mind? Is he freaking out in his head as that's happening? And is the mental part the, the thing that Karen Chick can't get over the hump on? Yeah, I'll start with Kelly because uh, yeah. it, when you kind of get in that first couple of scenarios in your big league tenure where you're on the road and you're facing, you know, quality hitters in, yeah. in a tight situation, the, the inning can speed up on you. And perhaps that's what happened with him last night. Uh, I, I think the arsenal is there, but maybe uh, a little bit more in kind of that bridge situation uh, that would allow him, whether it's behind in the game or in a spot to try and eat up some innings. With Karen Chak, it, it feels like he's shown everything that needs to be shown, whether that's controlling the running game, whether that's being able to, to, to showcase the breaking ball again. Uh, to me, you know, y- y- you can do a lot worse uh, by not having him up here. And, and I think that's kind of where the state of this pen is. You need every viable swing and miss arm. Yeah. As I said, especially with the opponents you're going to be facing here. These are critical junctures, guys. You had every opportunity to win that game and shut it down last night. Just wish that a guy like Karen Chak, who has that swing and miss ability in the big-time situations, and most importantly, the heartbeat and the experience to be able to draw on and go out there and get it done. Uh, Jensen, you, you spoke on it a little bit earlier. You said, you know, with the young guys – uh, Allen, uh, Bybee, and Williams, there's there's a chance they could get shut down if they do make the playoffs. Um, is there a chance that, you know, your, some of your three best pitchers, one or two of them, depending on how many innings they have accumulated by then, could possibly be shut down even in a playoff scenario? Uh, I think it's already been implemented, uh, you know, as far as where they think these guys could go. It, you, you would expect it's not necessarily the pitch count, it's more the inning count, and, and you saw that sort of with Gavin uh, in his last start, didn't go beyond the fifth inning. I think you'll see a, an intriguing use of those three guys and, and where they are stress-wise going through August and, and what you hope is, is a full month of September. I, I haven't heard anything about them being shut down at all. I think they take it kind of turn by turn and, and see where it, where it ends up. I think they really want to get through 6 p.m. tonight to understand what their roster looks like. You still got some reinforcements down there in AAA, of course, Cody Morris, Hunter Gaddis. Heck, we might even see Joey Cantillo, the way he's been throwing the ball. So there's plenty of length, if you will. It's just a matter of roster construction now and how you want to cultivate the back end of your bullpen. Because, indeed, if it is, hey, we only can throw Gavin, you know, maybe five innings, we can only throw ten or five innings, you've got to have a guy you can go to every couple of days outside of Xavier Curry that can help bridge the gap while still being effective and trying to win those games as well. Justin, how do you see a shortstop playing out? And is there any chance he's already here in Andres Jimenez? That's probably a move that would happen next year, but is there any chance they would move Jimenez to short and maybe Freeman is the, is the new second base? I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing. Or is it still going to be Arias or what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of questions to be answered, Jason, uh, for those guys initially, but Brian Rocchio down there, who has yeah. had a sensational season, is going to factor into this conversation. Uh, you know, I wonder if this is kind of your, your audition uh, here in August and September and, and hopefully October for both those guys. Uh, you know, whether Jimenez moves over or not, I, I think they're comfortable leaving him at second base, knowing if Rocchio is the guy in the future, that they leave Rocchio at short, Jimenez at second. That's a really, really outstanding defensive yeah. double play combination. Again, Rocchio not going to hit for the power. Uh, that perhaps Gabriel Arias could. Uh, I think Freeman deserves a, a bit more of an opportunity sustained, you know, not just one start every series. But I'm fascinated to see if those guys end up playing well, if both of them do. And then this front office has a decision at the winter meetings to possibly package them in a trade that might see one or both of them go. Hmm. Jensen, last thing. Trade deadline, obviously, today at 6 o'clock, right? In terms of other teams, we saw the big trade with Max Scherzer. We've seen... We've seen two teams like the Angels and Cubs who we thought were out of it, and maybe, but they've been aggressive here this last week. Maybe Verlander gets traded. To me, one of the biggest storylines today, and I think the Tigers probably trade a couple of their pitchers, will the Orioles, who have been so bad and are having a magnificent season, 
They've got to get starting pitching. To, it, that's, to me, one of the biggest things I'm looking at today. And will the Yankees do anything? I hope they don't because I want them to finish freaking dead last. But do you think the Orioles will do anything? Do you expect the Yankees to make a move? you think Verlander gets done? Any big uh, other big deals today? Yeah, the, the Verlander one is intriguing just because uh, Baltimore obviously has the prospect capital, but uh, are, are the Mets willing to really wave the white flag, not only for this year, but that yeah. means they're in real dire straits for next year. I think Eduardo Rodriguez is the big name to watch early. Uh, I would put the Cincinnati Reds in contention possibly for him as well. I know the Dodgers have really been hot on on his tail, but I'm with you, Bull. I mean, Baltimore has to find at least uh, a, a top flight arm, if yeah. not Verlander, someone like Rodriguez that can really get them some quality innings and, if need be, start a game one of a postseason series. I'll tell you, if I, uh, I know we got to go. I know we got to go, Earl. But I, I, if I'm the Orioles, and I know it would take a lot to get him, but Mitch Keller is, finally, is coming to his own this year. If I'm the Orioles, because they have a thin starting rotation, their bullpen's great, I'd go – it cost a lot, but I'd go get Keller and Bednar. If you had Bednar, Cano, and uh, – what's his name? Tyler Wells. Uh, no, they're closer. Uh, I, Bautista. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, Bautista. I couldn't think of his name. If you had those three in the back of the pen and you added a young Mitch Keller who's really – I know, yeah, they'd have to give up a boatload to get those guys. But I think that'd be huge for, for the Orioles. I don't, I don't know if it's going to happen, but we'll see. It should be fun. Yeah, that, that, that's a full-on Texas Ranger. We're yeah. all in, and yeah. I, would, I would love to see it because you guys know the AL is wide open. It is. And I think Baltimore, with the way they're playing, and as you said, Bautista is an AL Cy Young candidate yeah. the way he's pitched, and, and that five-out save last night, dear Lord, he's been fun to watch. Yeah, let's hope the Yankees keep losing. Thanks, Jensen. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you again soon. You- there you go. Did you guys cut Jensen off? I mean, How dare you? Damn. Guy's getting violent. You guys have worked up back there. There he is. Yeah, there he is. Jensen, we'll see you later. (laughs) (laughs) What happened? Uh, Earl's very excited about some dopey pole. No, it's not that. We got a full rundown. We got to keep moving.